I'm here with Joe McNally, um, and um, I'm pretty sure for most of my listeners, I mean, that's not a name that rings too familiar. Uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have seen some of your images, which are quite iconic, some of them. Uh, I'm still very impressed about the photo you did of the guy changing the light bulb on top of the Empire State Building. Tell me, why are you in Denmark? Well, I was invited um, very graciously by folks who are organizing um, this series of photo fairs. It's, uh, they, they are located largely in Scandinavia, and this is actually the biggest and first that, of its kind that they've had here in Denmark. So it's called Photo Masson, um, and it's right down in the Forum in, in uh, you know, downtown Copenhagen. And it's you know, typical in certain ways. It's a gathering of uh, photo enthusiasts, uh, professionals, hobbyists, uh, manufacturers, and we just kind of you know, we talk photography all weekend long, which some folks think like, wow, that's not my idea of a great weekend. But, you know, for, for us, we, we managed to have fun doing it. Yeah, I mean, I guess when, when I went there, because that, actually this is my first photo fair, and, and one of the things I thought was uh, really a lot of guys here. I mean, not many girls. I mean, it's, it's a lot of guys, and it's a lot of guys my age and older. True. Yeah. Uh, you know, in my classes, I, I do a bit of teaching, you know, photographically now. And, and I would say, you know, most of my classes are probably 70% male, you know. And I, I think what happens is a lot of folks, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story with variations. Photography was my first love. But then life happened, and I became a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, and that people have had successful careers doing other things quite well, but then circled back to photography because they loved it so much when they were kids, and they abandoned it for one reason or another. You actually just described my life. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's so precise. I was supposed to be an apprentice uh, as a commercial photographer, and, 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 and something went wrong with the guy who wanted to have me on, and, and I just found something else to do. I ended up doing this. Uh, yeah. You, well, it's, it's, it is it's is that kind of thing. And one, if you have that love of, of it, it could express itself in any number of ways, the love of communicating, the love of the experience of being in the light and in the air with a camera in your hands. Some folks fall in love with it because they're, honestly, they're gearheads. You know, they like the stuff, you know. There's any number of, you know, sort of, um, you know, s subgroup of passions underneath the overall passion for photography. Mm. Why did you enter photography back in the day? I, I kind of couldn't help myself. I, I knew I wanted to be a journalist and, um, and talk about full circle. I now have a blog and I'm back writing again. And in finding that I enjoy that, I went to school to be a writer. But during the course of that writing curriculum, I, I was required to take a photography class. And then I just said, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is this is more what I want to do. You know, and uh, the camera felt natural in my hands. You know, I borrowed my dad's camera. You know, very typical sort of thing. You know, and I mean, and, and you you wrote a few books actually, and, and I can highly recommend that. And 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 actually, that's one of the reasons why I'm having you on this show because, uh, as I told you in the car, we're driving out here that you and another guy that that very few people in Denmark know about. You sort of responsible for for leaving me close to bankruptcy actually because <laughs> i'm sorry to hear that. I mean, <laughs> but i take no responsibility for well, that you really. have to you have to use you ruin it for me i was supposed to have a, a really nice hobby just uh, photographing my grandchildren uh -huh. and um and now i'm 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 spending a lot of money on speed lights and joe mcnally soft boxes and stuff like that it's really, I mean, well, you know, there there is there is that component of it to be sure. We found ourselves in this digital, you know, um hurricane, you know, of technology and new stuff all the time. Um as I always caution, especially younger people getting into this industry, I always caution them that the camera manufacturers, you know, I always say, you know, those sons of bitches, you know, they're <laughs> seductive and they're, Pushes. you know, the lure of more pixels and all of that. But, and that has facilitated us to a great, de great degree. I, I have no qualms about the technology. It's actually enlarged the envelope for many people, myself included. But the age old mission of being a photographer hasn't changed. And that's still a pretty tough and tall order to be a good communicator. Mm. And that was true back in the day of glass plates. And it's true now in the digital age.
And actually, that's one of the things that's really great about you. And that's one of the reasons why you are my hero and not a lot of other guys, because you describe yourself as, as a generalist uh, within photography. Um, True. Well, I, I've been a general assignment, mostly magazine shooter for my whole career. And uh, I think I kind of knew early on in my career there are certain photographers, you know, who I admire a great deal, who could sort of bend the world to their will and you know uh, I always cite Mary Ellen Mark very famous American photographer and there was a period of time Mary Ellen's style was so definitive and so declarative that she actually would tell clients well okay I'll shoot this job for you but I'm only right now I'm only shooting black and white 8 by 10 hmm. and clients would say okay <laughs> you know I I could never do that, you know. I have always been in the realm of being an assignment guy, you know, and and a pretty good photographer across the board, you know, in the sense of being able to do a number of things relatively well. So I always describe myself as a useful photographer, you know, to magazines, uh, you know, because if a story comes along at the National Geographic that has a variety of different things or styles, like journalism in the streets, uh, say some portraiture, maybe a bit of concept photography or production work, they will occasionally at least turn to me because I am comfortable with doing different things with a camera mm. and I mean and you've been around for a while uh, you're 60 years old so so you, you started back in the film days and, yep. and 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 did a lot of stuff back then and you shot the first uh, full digital um, series for National Geographic was that? true yep. I uh, the magazine had experimented with some digital imagery prior to that but the I did a story that was a cover story in December 2003 it was the first all first all digital coverage for the Geographic. First time the magazine had ever done a story without shooting a scrap of film, and that was a sea change for the organization in many ways. Now, of course, you know the you know magazines across the board and Geographic are almost entirely digital, but that that story really opened the door for Geographic. They had been used to getting little yellow boxes of Kodachrome shipped in. Now all of a sudden all of photographers are starting to send in electronic files. It was a big big workflow change for them and also a change in their culture, I think. And basically it's it changed photography as a whole and I guess that also opened the door for 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 another side of your business, I'm um, teaching. I mean, because mm. these days everybody is a photographer, right? Sure. Not um, not everybody is a great photographer, but every, everybody is a photographer. Yep. Everybody's, you know, telling the story of their own life you know whether it's uh, uh uh you know a professional level or whether it's their facebook page and i i have you know uh, i embrace that i think i i wrote in in a book once that you know the digital thing has turned photography from a two-lane country road into an eight-lane superhighway where lots of folks are moving very, very fast. So it's really opened the doors. This had been a very arduous thing to do. I mean, back in the day, if you really wanted to be serious about this as a hobby, you'd have to build a dark room. You know, convert half of your bathroom into a into a uh, you know a wet dark room, and it was it's a hassle. You know, uh, and so now the instantaneous. Uh, response of digital is uh, again very seductive to folks, very appealing, and uh, the idea of of uh, the immediacy of it has changed so much about what I do, and certainly the way uh, news organizations operate. You know, because you've got folks with iPhone pictures, and something happens, and Bing, literally within minutes, images are on the web. Hmm. So has has this done your job harder? It's harder for me uh, in in certain ways, harder for any photographer, really, I think, to um, stay afloat, get good work. I mean, there's been, uh, you know, certain kinds of assignments or, um, you know, areas of photography that had been a source of financing for the professionals have now dissipated. And, and uh, you know, a lot of things because the facility of the technology, things are maybe done in-house that they formerly would go seek the assistance of a professional photographer to get accomplished. But thankfully, there's still, you know, um, uh, for me and, and, and my colleagues, there's still a, a level or tier of work that we compete for or aspire to that is still, you know, the province of the professional. And 
Uh, we just got a job at my studio that is a, a wonderful job. It's it's sort of different from the way it used to be, but I'm doing a, a commemorative book for a, a hospital chain, a very well-known hospital chain in New York. They've asked me to go through the run of their hospital operations and create an 80 to 100 page book as a commemorative book for a gala they're doing in the spring. So it's it's a th- it's probably 30 days of, of shooting, mm. and I have to produce that by the end of January. So crunch is on, and, and that's a, a different kind of job than I would have gotten as a young photographer, where it was more like a magazine calls you up and says, hey, can you go shoot this picture of so-and-so tomorrow and give us the film the next day? Two big things that I've sort of came across is the giant uh, Polaroid uh, stuff you did um, and the naked Olympians. Yeah, as as I always say, if you want to get noticed, get people naked. <laughs> you know, everybody like you know, just all of a sudden says, "Hey, look at this guy's pictures." You know, all these people that aren't wearing clothes. You know, and so but, yeah, I had proposed to Life Magazine when I was a staff photographer there, and um, and to my boss, it was kind of a courageous decision on his part because Life is a very mainstream magazine. I said, "I want to shoot the Olympians nude," and he was like, "You can do that, you know." And I said, "Yeah, I think we can, and you can shoot it in a way that I can publish it." That was his big question, and I said, "Yes, I think I can." And now, of course, you know, fast forward, it's almost like, you know, for athletes, it's a rite of passage to take their clothes off for yeah. the camera, you know, because athletes have become this emblem of you know human excellence and this and that and and uh, people are curious about it but at that point in time it was a bit of a first and the magazine i have to admit did really well in publishing it they ran it very sizably and it did get a lot of attention and it was all done in the best possible taste i mean that's I was not after erotic content. <laughs> let's put it that way. I was, I was, you know, taking a look at these athletes' bodies in the way that, and seeing what happens to them when they strive in the way that they do. Like uh, the uh, a woman came across the finish line in the marathon trials, and she won, so it meant that she was going to go to the Olympics. And so I was waiting there at the finish line, and uh, she came over, and I had her lay down on a mattress that we put in a in a parking lot, and proper feet up on a on a, um, a sawhorse, and I was basically an impromptu studio, and I photographed the bottoms of her feet unadorned, we mm-hmm. took her shoes off, photographed the bottoms of her feet. I wanted to see what her feet looked like after running 26.2 miles. Mm-hmm. And they were a mess. Mm-hmm. And that technically is a nude, you know, because yeah. there's no clothing involved, yeah. you know. So that was kind of the direction the whole thing took. Very few people would, would find this erotic, but a few would. Yes, true. I mean, <laughs> she, her boyfriend did look at me and he said, how do we know you're not just some guy from New York with a foot fetish? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, that can happen. <laughs> the the world's only giant Polaroid camera existed for a time in New York City, and it w- was a singular instrument. It was actually the invention of Dr. Land himself. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, it's a massive, balky instrument. It actually physically is the studio. It's not a movable item. Mm. So the interior chamber of the camera is, um, as I always say, the size of a one-car garage. And there's a, basically a lens in the wall. It's, and it's a, almost like a giant pinhole camera in certain ways. Mm. But it's a life-size camera. It's kind of a, uh, you could refer to it as a copy camera. In fact, that's what Polaroid used it for for many years, was to copy massive pieces of art. So um, fortuitously, you know, it ended up in New York City. 9-11 occurred. I had had some experience with the camera prior to 9-11. And I thought that the stature of that camera, that kind of majestic nature of the way it renders people, would be an appropriate instrument perhaps to to employ at that time uh, to document people who were seriously involved, whose lives had intersected with 9-11 in a major way. I got the funding for it and we moved into the studio and we shot for almost a month, three weeks and change, um, living in the studio, working pretty much nonstop, uh, photographing uh, 9-11, uh, you know, firefighters, cops, uh, rescue workers, uh, volunteers, you name it, um, families, etc. cetera, uh, in this very unique format of camera. And uh, it became a show and a book. Mm -hmm. And it helped raise quite a bit of money that was then donated to the relief of downtown public education. Mm. 
And actually, I, I guess that started one of the one of the things that if you've been doing since. I mean, you have a special relationship to firefighters. I mean, you've shot a few. Sure. I mean, it's it's hard not to you know become friends with these guys mm. you know you, you see their their basic decency uh their mission you know is a, a selfless one and a dangerous one so uh yes i i have remained in touch one of the things that i always feel about being a photographer especially in a highly emotionally charged project and time like that is to maintain a certain sense of constancy and not just like snap a picture and go and so The very first firehouse that came in front of the camera was uh, Ladder 9, Engine 33 on Great Jones Street, which is a classic New York firehouse. They suffered severe losses on that day. And because those guys had the faith to be the first ones, uh, every 9-11 morning since then, for the last 11 years, I've gone and I go to that firehouse in the morning. Mm. And I'm I'm not a firefighter. I don't want anybody to misconstrue. I just stand off quietly to the side and I pay my respects. And I know the guys in that house appreciate it. You know, they, they're like, yeah, that's a and that's an okay thing to do by them, mm. you know, to stick with them. Do you get a, a relation to a lot of the people that you've Yes and no. I mean, sometimes it's a cursory moment, you know, when you're photographing someone. Some folks you don't want a relationship That's with right. afterwards. <laughs> you know, we're done here. We're done. Thank you very much. Um, you know, but yes, I I I enjoy people. I enjoy that uh, the relationship that builds around the idea of a photo shoot. I'm always very very conscious of the fact that someone who steps in front of your camera is uh, surrendering themselves to you in certain ways. They're, that's a very vulnerable place to be out in front of the camera lens. And that's a, a leap of faith in you. And I think that leap of faith has to be rewarded with some measure of relationship, friendship, or certainly, um, you know, uh, a, a some way that you can contribute back to them for having given you that gift. Mm. Uh, for instance, models. I have uh, uh, lots of photographers tend to move on. They're always looking for the new face. I mean, in the fashion world, that's absolutely they need to do that. But for me, because I find the human face fascinating and I develop relationships with people, I've I photographed certain folks, certain models, certain friends of mine probably for 10 or 12 years mm. you know i'll go back and photograph them again try it you know do something different yeah. i started as a newspaper newspaper wire surface photographer in new york in the 1970s god almighty <laughs> <laughs> uh you know so uh yes but i kind of migrated through that fairly quickly uh i was actually speaking with a bunch of Danish press photographers just last night at Photomasan and and I told them flat out I said look I moved pretty quickly through press photography because I think A realized I wasn't going to be very good at that and B the paper I was working for fired me so that was kind of like you know <laughs> inspiration okay to quit then. <laughs> you know <laughs> um, and I also kind of discovered color along the way and found I had a good color palette you know I have an imagination and And that was maybe more the realm that I should try to live in photographically. Mm. Is it hard to get new ideas? I mean, what do you do to 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 stay relevant? I mean, because there's a lot of young guys out there. I mean, in all businesses, in and, and I mean, I've spent a lot of time in in the music business, and and there's always these young guys thinking really wild stuff up and and and, and biting your ass basically. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? To stay? It's okay. We're in Denmark. You can swear on the radio. I can, I can swear in the radio. Yeah, you can that's, do that. That's so relieving. <laughs> oh my god. Um, Well, yeah, I think I think first off, you know, there's probably an open question certainly with some folks whether I am still at all relevant <laughs> on any level, which is okay by me. Um I do uh, I I think it's incumbent on any photographer to engage in a process of reinvention on a fairly regular basis, at least once in a while. Uh you know, certainly that's happened with us where uh, you know, the digital thing happened and i uh you know big projects started to recede a bit you know because of the budgetary requirements and and the field kind of changed 
And I have a, a friend who's a landscape photographer in New York. He's a big guy. His name is Moose Peterson. And he's he's a big dude. Is He is what his name suggests. <laughs> and so he came after me, and he, and he looked at me, and he goes, <clears throat> got to start writing a blog. I'm like, okay, Moose. <laughs> so six months go by, and then I'd see him again. And he wouldn't say hello. He would just look at me and go, where's your blog? <laughs> you know, I mean, Moose is very insistent when mm. he wants you to do something, you know? So finally I said, t- t- all right, all right, I'll, I'll t- dip my toe in these waters. I'll start writing a blog. And you know, another reinvention. I mean, uh, the blog, my, uh, the blog has about 2 million readers a year. And to me, that's really kind of cool because it's like having a, a, a modest newspaper column. And now I realize, you know, too, that, you know, those magazines that hired me historically, like Time and Newsweek, they're not going to call me anymore. Mm. You know, Newsweek is ceasing print publication at the end of this year. It's going to go entirely online. I grew up shooting for Newsweek. I I shot maybe five or six covers of Newsweek over the years. But um, that's going away. And now I find another venue to simply get published. I'm a publications photographer, so I I can self-assign you know, and think, well, I want to do this project. I don't care if no one else is interested. I'll put it on my blog. And de facto, it is then, you know, published. Mm. So it's cool. But, I mean, even after all these years, because you've been at at this for 35 plus years, Mm -hmm. um, um, do you still shoot for fun? I mean, you're in Copenhagen for for a few days. I mean, are you a tourist? Uh, Do you go around the streets of Copenhagen shooting landmarks? I don't do kind of the tourist thing particularly well um you know i do carry a camera in a place like copenhagen because it's beautiful um uh, i look at light you know and and uh, if i can find something interesting that is on the cusp of a day or something like that i'll i'll definitely go after it in terms of trying to construct something that's worthwhile photographically um making you know snaps of tivoli or something from the outside i i don't do that particularly well so uh, it's not something i pursue sometimes i come to some place and i think wow you know um i create an assignment based on the location or where i'm going to i i shoot dance as a as a bit of a hobby within the context of my being a photographer so occasionally it it would happen that i would call like the ballet company and say i'm going to be in town um And here's my website. I've shot a lot of dance. I've worked with a lot of major dancers. If you have any dancers who might need a picture or be interested in participating, uh, could I be put in touch with them? Hmm. And the web is great because you can instantly establish your credibility. If you didn't have a website, you could be any creep, you know, who's calling <laughs> up saying, hey, you know, I got a dancer who wants to work with me. You know, I mean, that's, you know, that sort of stuff establishes legitimacy that you're pursuing this in a, in a worthwhile way. And there's a benefit to the dancer, perhaps, if they are interested in, uh, in doing, you know, uh, creating something of their own archive of pictures, because I always pay, pay the dancer first off to model. And I always make the pictures available to them in the aftermath. Hmm. So when you go to a dinner or something, I mean, uh, are you like when you when you sit next to a doctor and people are telling the doctor about? I mean, I have this aching knee and stuff. And you, I mean, when you sit next to somebody and, they, and you tell them that you're a photographer, I mean, what happens there? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it it can be kind of funny. It can it can be very sincere and wonderful. I mean, I find people to be good-hearted and a lot of folks who pick up a camera are absolutely enthralled and very passionate about it and they'll have questions or which is fine um the the somewhat i find it amusing the flip side of it is kind of you will occasionally run into that character who will say oh yeah yeah i'm a photographer you know (laughs) or i used to be a photographer it's amazing how many people used to be photographers you know uh and i'm like oh yeah cool yeah yeah i I had a guy i wrote about it i couldn't couldn't resist writing about it he was a helicopter pilot and he was definitely a gearhead he had like tons of stuff and he was telling me about all the amazing cameras that he had and and this and that at the end of this discussion of gear he goes yeah i got one problem you know is my big problem is content (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, well, dude, that's a big problem to have. <laughs> <It is>. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to laugh, you know, it's like, yep, that's a problem, you know. But I mean, it, it must get to be a problem 
every once in a while for a guy like you. I mean, if it, coming up with new stuff because I mean, it's very important to have ideas, right? Definitely different ideas because I mean, nobody can make a living just shooting important people. Very few, <laughs> very few at this point. And I, and again, I'm not a mainstream contributor. I'm still I'm still working for the Geographic. I still uh, I'm a little bit of a problem solver for the Geographic. But yes, coming up with ideas is the heart and soul of the matter, yeah. I think. Um, without ideas, you, it doesn't matter how much gear you've got. So I always am thinking, and, and I'm always cr- trying to create proposals. That's also the uh, in the wake of the digital onslaught here that we're talking about is something that I think photographers have to adjust to and understand that they can't sit there and wait for the phone to ring. They have to create proposals, um, suggest things, meet with people, uh, go seek work on a very proactive basis. Whereas when I was a young photographer, you know, not much money was changing hands at all, you know, but the phone would ring like crazy. Mm. Like, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do that? And there were these small little snippets of assignments. Now the way we survive is to get much, much bigger jobs but those are tough to come by and those oftentimes require the seeking of them and the cre- at least partially the creation of the of the idea of the job or the proposal for the job be- falls on you as the photographer mm. we've been describing you as a generalist and you do that, that yourself but, but even then i mean you have a speciality because you're like the guy with all the light i mean oh. <laughs> when, whenever you do stuff i mean you light a lot i do um you know um you know you fan of clint clint eastwood movies yeah i mean mean, yeah movies i I guess it's okay i mean he had i was not too crazy about what he did recently uh but i mean that's another story (laughs) i couldn't i couldn't stand that i I, in fact my my i think i may stop watching some of his reruns at this point but but um one of his famous characters i think it was josie wales said he just said you know Sometimes trouble just follows a man, you know, and and years ago I did this thing for the geographic. Uh, They asked me to light Ellis Island and I plunged ahead. I'm like, okay, yeah, we can do that. You know, solve the problem, et cetera. Oh my God, it was a horror show of a job, but I produced a picture that the magazine liked. And I think a couple of folks noticed that and said, okay. This guy knows how to use lights. This guy is unafraid of the scope of a job. And so all of a sudden I became this kind of like, uh, you know, yeah. the oh, the lighting guy, you know, which is a bit of a misnomer in certain ways. Uh, I do a, a lecture. I have a, a small lecture I do called One Light, Two Light, where probably my favorite pictures are done with either no flash or one one light mm-hmm. you know and uh i did a book quite a while ago called moment of clicks and a guy just lambasted me uh in, in a critical review and he said yeah if you've got a hundred lights this book might be valuable so i counted the pictures in the book and almost 70 percent of them were available light <laughs> you know and i sent him a note you know and never heard back but you know <laughs> But when you look at this picture, because I mean, it's basically a big building, um, sure, um, and and there's light in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but what people don't know is there's no electricity there. Whenever you show this picture, I mean, or people see it somewhere, I mean, do you do you get the urge to go and tell them, you know, all that's all that light? No, I wasn't there. <laughs> I actually don't. I prefer to leave it alone, to be yeah. honest, because it was in you know the only reason there was no electricity at that time certainly not enough was it was a construction shell at the time and being rebuilt from the inside out so but no i i actually try to avoid that conversation it's like it, they're like oh that was nice yeah so you're yeah. okay with people just flipping by in them in the magazines oh yeah that's absolutely really nice absolutely building. i think it gets back to my basic philosophy of being a photographer is that we should get out of the way yeah. and let the pictures do the work and the main mission i think we have or a big piece of it is to be as transparent in the pro- process as possible so that the reader has an uninterrupted pleasure, an uninterrupted or, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the, the the seamless experience for the reader is there. So they're not like, 
you don't want them to look at a photograph and wonder what the photographer is doing. You want them to simply enjoy or be informed or moved by the photograph. So that connection to the picture wants to be very direct. Mm. And I think the photographer should excuse themselves from that process. We made the picture and then we step into the background. Mm. Two years ago, I, I didn't know it, that much about I knew some of the pictures. I mean, because you, there's some, some really uh, famous pictures, the one of uh, Gorbachev you did. Uh, and this, I mean, the nude Olympians. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, guy, <laughs> I'm a guy. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, I knew about the pictures, but not about you. But for the last couple of years, I mean, my, my hobby just went really crazy. Uh, and, and suddenly I stumbled upon you because you're an educator as well. Um, yeah. And you're really good at it. Has it always been like that? I've been a photographer teaching as well as doing uh, big assignments. No, not really. Uh, I, I've probably done off and on taught workshops for twenty, twenty-five years. You know, that was always a, a you know, something uh, that we would do or engage in. You know, be asked to do a lecture, or be asked to do this or that, and uh, I always have enjoyed it because. I like people and I, I, I relate well, I think, in a in a teaching environment. Um, but I also hark back to when I was a young photographer. It was It's very much, this business is very much a pass it along business, always has been. So when I came up as a young photographer, I was really blessed by knowing some really, really good photographers. I mean, people who were masters, people who were staff photographers at Life, um, some of the veterans at the newspaper I started working at really good shooters and they sometimes fiercely would mentor you you know and they would tell you when your stuff was just garbage and they would mince no words and they would um urge you to uh in no uncertain terms to get better at this or basically die you know um so that i recall that process of mentoring it's a time-honored process and i think anything that i do now is just basically in service to that it's a different way of mentoring now. Uh, and I think it's actually even more important because the collective staff experience is going away. I used to tell young photographers, best thing you can do, go to a newspaper, get a job in a newspaper. Then you'll become part of a staff. Doesn't matter if it's a staff of six or a staff of 30. You'll be surrounded by people who have more experience who are better than you. Mm. And they will drag you along. They will make you better. And that collective experience of being in the dark room or coming back to the to the workroom at the end of the day and just bullshitting each other and talking, you get better just by accumulating that those layers of experience. Mm -hmm. Now that that's all gone away. I'm not saying there's no more staffs. There there are, but everybody gets their assignments electronically and delivers them electronically. So that the communal experience that was, uh, you know, uh, given to most of us at some point in their career of being a staff photographer a co in a collection of photographers has has disappeared. Mm. It's been replaced by the web, you know, in many ways. I think no matter, I mean, there there are, I'm sure, some younger photographers out there who look at my workflow and think it's like, you know, this guy's out there with like, a chisel and a rock basically you know carving stone tablets you know so they might not have any need for it that's okay mm. but i think as i as i said you know the the basics of photography the storytelling aspects of it and certainly uh no matter how fancy the digital equation gets it's still the same equation it's the question of applying light and using light to tell a story and craft you know, uh, as my friend David Burnett, who's a quintessentially fine photojournalist, he says, the photographer, all the photographer owns is this, mm -hmm. the frame, you know, and what you see and how you see it. And that is, you know, absolutely essentially the heart of the matter for, for a photographer. So I think if you can educate and inform along that path, it's a worthwhile thing. Mm. Yeah, but, I mean, it certainly helped me. Um, that, was a, that was a time when I swore I would never, when I started out i would never ever use a flash because that is terrible i mean that's and that's one of the hardest parts when you're starting out to grasp because i mean it's just i mean you don't understand why it's built in the camera why does it look like crap uh, but it does um and i mean you told me about that and i own a few now um so <laughs> if um if you should i mean if you should say a few things to to people you're starting out or, or people you're shooting for for fun of it and for for the family um, uh, what, is there a few 
pieces of advice you, you can give just generally uh, to people? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, don't do what you did. Spend all your money on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good advice. Very uh, sound advice. Um, no, I, I think, you know, photography as a, as a love, as a passion is where it starts. But then I think if you hook that up, with subject matter you love. And a lot of people's first and foremost reason for pick up a camera is when they achieve parenthood, when they're and they have kids, it's like, okay, now I've got these built in subjects, you know, right. I've got to document this child. And that to me is a completely wonderful and natural thing because I always encourage folks to shoot something that's accessible to them and something they love. Right. Something that's important because it it isn't about the gear in the sense that there has to be emotion in your photographs. And sometimes we shear ourselves off from the emotion because the technology is so daunting. We get so flustered and it's like worried about f-stops and shutter speeds in the camera and that our pictures get removed and tentative because they lack con you, la you don't have confidence in the tools, so your pictures lack confidence. So one of the other things that I would suggest to someone is is you know, do a couple of courses, do some basic stuff, get familiar with the camera enough so some of that anxiety recedes to the back of your head and does, and what dominates the front of your head is, okay, what do I want to shoot? Yeah. You know, clear the decks, in other words, get some of the technique stuff down. That way you can approach your subject matter with more confidence. Joe, um, we're just about there, but I mean, as I told you before, the, I mean, my show is kind of a music show. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't been talking about music at all. For me to air this, you need to tell me about some of your favorite music. Well, the, you know, the, <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned someone who's a favorite earlier, Mark Cohen. Yeah. You know, just a wonderful singer songwriter. You know, um, and uh, you know, I, I, if I'm a generalist when I have a camera in my hand, I'd say I'm a generalist when it comes to music as mm. well. You know, I love music. Music gets you through. You know, and I can remember being in uh, some really dodgy places where you'd go to sleep at night and had no idea what was going to crawl over you at night or something like that. And I'd have my music where, you know, because I'm old, you know, it was like a Walkman or a Discman or yeah. something like that. It was always part of my gear kit to have music with me. So I enjoy across the board, you know, kinds of music. I kind of grew up on, on you know, some some R and B and soul. Believe it or not, yeah. you know, uh, you know, some some OJ's, some MFSB, you know, stuff like that. When I was, you know, back in school, um, and then you know, some 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 protest music, and you know, Joan Baez, and this is like this is like ancient history but uh those were kind of the things that i that i've listened to over the years now i kind of you know historically probably my my favorite you know um singer songwriter in many ways is van morrison you know has always spoken to my heart you know yeah. in many 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 ways but i like some new stuff too like yeah. you know uh florence and the machine i love her voice yeah. really love her voice uh the raconteurs you know kind of cool um and uh, there's a, there's a, I'm going to get this, the Times just reviewed, I'm going to say this wrong, Titus and uh, Andronicus, it's a, it's a punk band in New York okay. that the Times just, just, I probably am saying this wrong. Um, I just read a review on it and the guy's lyrics just sound really interesting. So I think I'm going to take a, a, a quick look at that yeah. too, you know, so I'm kind of all over the lot. You know, well, in lots of ways. I guess that's a way to stay relevant as well. I mean, to just keep in touch with the popular culture, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the extent. I mean, also the way I stay in touch. I've got two young assistants. You know, one's 23, the other's about to turn 30, and they a give me a ton of grief, <laughs> and b they never let me. L you know, when we're setting up for a job, they never plug the sound jack into my iPhone, you know, because it's my soundtrack and they make it clear that they're not interested, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, um, what's the, what's the, there's a new um, Mumford and Sons yeah. um, um, that, that just came out that my assistant Drew li is listening to a lot. I like that, you know. Yeah. I don't even know if I'm getting the titles of these bands right. Well, you're, 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 um, you're close. I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, you just made sure that I'm actually able to air this because 
you you mentioned some really relevant names <laughs> for the show that I do and stuff that I play. So okay. I mean that's I mean it's no problem. It's been it's been a real pleasure having you. Um, um, I'm, so, I'm so pleased to meet you, and I got to meet my photography Robert Plant. Uh, that oh was, Lord, that, <laughs> that was really cool. So uh, thank you very much, Joe. And um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you for having me on.